7 ways to overcome church hurt. Church is a community of believers who are not all on the same plane with maturity. Sin, misunderstanding is bound to happen. Now, I've been a pastor for about 20 years. Some of you are like, when did you start becoming a pastor in your mother's womb? Not really. But I became a youth pastor at the age of 16. And then at about the age of 30, so this was about six years ago, that I was transitioned into a lead pastor role. And so I grew up all my life in church. But the last 20 years, I was heavily involved in the leadership, leading the youth group and then now leading the church. So talk about hurt, gossip, misunderstanding, sin. I mean, I've seen a lot of that. I'm still a Christian. I love the church and I love Christians. And I am who I am today because of even some things that I've experienced in the church. At first, I was just against a bunch of Christians for being immature and bad. But then I realized God was also trying to develop certain fruits of the Spirit, certain virtues that couldn't be developed unless I was treated unfairly. I'm not in any way advocating for abuse or staying in a toxic church. And we're going to address that in just a moment. But I want to remind you that it's possible to be like Zacchaeus, who is trying to see Jesus and people who were close to Jesus didn't help Zacchaeus. Sometimes those closest to the church aren't very helpful to those who are far from Jesus. Add to that, Potential problems, false teachers, false brothers can come in the midst. False believers can also come into that mix. You know, Galatians 2, 4, it says, And this occurred because of false brethren secretly brought in. Meaning, there are some people that come to church that are completely fake. In Acts 20, 29, it talks about people who come into church that pretend to be shepherds, but are like savage wolves. So not only we got immaturity of believers, we got some devil spies in the church. We also got some pastors or leaders who are savage wolves, not shepherds. And so that could make it into a really interesting experience navigating all of that. The churches have never been perfect. Jesus is busy trying to perfect the church. Like read the New Testament. You will see James addresses class distinctions in his letter. He addresses misunderstandings about faith, careless gossip. We see the letter of Galatians is addresses issues of legalism. We see the letter of Colossians addresses heresy. We see that Corinth had a lot of problems. Like some people claim superiority over one another. They were suing one another. They were abusing communion. There was sexual misbehavior. Like read the book of Revelation chapter 2 or 3. You see that a lot of churches had some issues. Like one church was so bad, Jesus actually wanted to vomit. So this idea that like my church is the worst and every church is supposed to be perfect. It's kind of like not true. Churches just honestly a lot of sinners who've been redeemed, who are still learning to walk in their faith are gathering together. Church hurt can happen because of our faults, sins committed against us, or failed leadership. Now, sometimes it happens because people are offended. We get offended. We see people that walked away from Jesus because they were offended. Some people in church are just evil and they cause evil. So sometimes it could be us. We're just easily offended. Sometimes there are people in the church that are just evil. Like, think about Judas. Jesus rebukes Peter, but he doesn't rebuke Judas. Someone said one time, there's three types of people. There's the wise, foolish, and evil. You know, and the church really has all three of them. We have wise people, we have foolish people, and we have evil people. So some people are evil, and they cause evil. Like, think of Judas. Judas was evil. That's why Jesus didn't rebuke him. Peter was foolish. Jesus rebuked foolish people, and they got better. They got wise. They changed. So you rebuke the foolish person, but you don't rebuke an evil person because they're bent and doing evil. You just kind of leave them alone, distance yourself, walk away from them. And sometimes churches have these Judases who are traitors, who are backstabbers, who will trade you. They're just bad. You got to run away from them. Sometimes you got to call police and, and some churches need to have guns because these evil people are not good and we need to be protected. Now, another thing that why bad stuff happens in the church is because of bad leadership. Not all leaders are shepherds. Some are just flat out 
wolves. Jesus made it, mentioned it in John 10, 12. He says that some are hirelings, they're not shepherds, who don't care about the sheep. And when the wolf comes, they leave the sheep and they flee. And the wolf catches the sheep and scatters them. Like think of David and Saul. Like if you were under King Saul, like bad leadership. Like this guy was not only toxic, he was really, really harmful. He was harassing people, throwing spears at people. And David had to leave at one time and run away from Saul and never come back. He loved him. He honored him. He just didn't trust him. And some church leaders are like that. Now, if church hurt involves misunderstanding, understanding will solve it. If it involves intentional abuse, staying in that environment will not fix it. I mentioned about Judas and Peter. So discern between Peter and Judas. They both hurt Jesus, but Peter had a bad day. Judas had a bad heart. Peter was restored. Judas was released. So you must understand if it's a misunderstanding, that's why you got hurt. You just need to clarify your expectations. A person maybe is like Peter, kind of a little bit immature, a little bit foolish, and you just need to deal with them. You just need to restore them. You just need to rebuke them. You just need to speak up. But if you're dealing with Judas, if you're dealing with intentional evil bent on abuse, um, you gotta you gotta run. You gotta walk away because staying there and being silent and hoping that things will just be fixed, that doesn't happen. Evil people, they don't stop. They either have to be stopped or you just have to get out of the way. Getting hurt at the church does not mean your focus was on people, not on God. Now, I hear this a lot from people who are hurt at the church. And usually it comes from people like me, pastors. Oh, the reason why you got hurt is because you did not focus on God. You focused on people. But see, the church is an assembly. The church is the gathering of people. We are members in the body. People hurt people. And when you get hurt, it wasn't because you lost your focus. Now, it could be in some cases if you got super focused on people. But getting hurt doesn't mean that you had bad focus. It just sometimes means you were around bad people or you were around people that had a bad day or a bad season and they hurt you. I want to encourage you today not to let the church storm, not to let the church hurt, shipwreck your faith. You know, Paul one time wrote to Timothy 1 verse 18 through 19, and he says, this charge I commit to you, son Timothy, according to the prophecies previously made concerning you, that by them you may wage the spiritual warfare, the good warfare, having faith and the good conscience, which some have rejected concerning the faith, have suffered shipwreck. That means some people get blindsided by some issues. And the devil is out to steal your destiny, to steal your prophecy, to steal your purpose and God's promises. And he wants to blindside you with offense. He wants to blindside you with some bad leadership, misunderstanding, hurt feelings. He wants, he wants to blindside you so you forget the prophecies, the promises, and the purpose that God has for you. You must understand there is some spiritual warfare that's involved in that. I know people are, you know, need to be changed. People need to be confronted. People need to grow up, be mature. But I believe the devil uses the church hurt to hit people right in their face. And he wants you to experience shipwreck. You need to keep your faith in God, even if you lost faith in people. Let me say that again. You need to keep your faith in God, even if you lost faith in people. Usually we're not hurt at the church, but it's the people or the person in the church that hurt us. And healing may require to step away from a particular church for a season or not even return to that church at all. But if you don't return to any faith community, it will rob you from its most precious resource, a more refined and wiser and experienced you. You know, I hated those seasons when, you know, some people really got under my skin, you know, in the church, where they really were thorn in my flesh. Like, it was just painful experience. And I'm not talking about evil people. I'm talking about those annoying people. You know, and I didn't like when I was one of those annoying people. But I look back at it right now. I had to learn to confront lovingly. I had to learn to speak up. Let my feelings be heard. I had to learn to repent. I had to learn to humble myself. And I'm so glad those people allowed me to experience that sanctification. And they are glad that I allowed them to experience that instead of kicking them out of the church or just running away from the church when things get hard or when my feelings got hurt. 
Now, here are a few things that you can do today if you are going through right now a season of getting hurt by the church. Maybe you've seen really terrible things that are just beyond terrible. Perhaps people you pl place your trust in, not only they broke your trust, but they really embarrassed the name of Jesus. Maybe people in leadership committed money fraud, or they committed adultery, or maybe you were abused by somebody. And I just want to say, I'm so sorry that that happened to you. It's not your fault, but you don't have to allow your reaction to somebody's sin to also be sinful. You know, sometimes we actually make reactions to somebody's bad actions, and those reactions end up being bad. Like when Noah was drunk, that was bad. What his son did was equally bad. You know, when Moses got married to an Ethiopian lady, and though he said for Israelites not to marry people from other ethnicities, you know, he did what was wrong. But Miriam, she also did what was wrong, and she got leprosy. And I sometimes wonder if our reaction out of hurt toward people who hurt us could be as damaging to our own character, faith, and future. So here are a few things that I personally would encourage you to do today if you are hurt by the church or people in the church, if I could say more correctly. Number one is go to God in prayer. Get into God's Word. Find a promise for your hurt. Trust me, the Bible has a lot of poems, psalms, lamentations of people who were hurt. If you think that the Bible was written by people who always had a smile on, like read Book of Job, read Psalms. Like half of them are complaints, laments, cries. I love the Bible because it's honest. I can find myself anytime I open the psalm, I can find myself there. If I'm joyful, I can find myself there. If I'm offended, I can find myself there. If I'm hurt, if I am just feeling frustrated, I can find myself there. And so I bring my hurt to God. You know, I don't want to try to deal with that on my own. The same way if you get hurt physically, you get shot, God forbid. You know, you don't try to do a surgery on yourself. You go to the doctor, you go to a hospital. So same thing, go to God, go to God's Word. Secondly, resolve your own past and your own sins. A lot of times in Matthew 7, 3, Jesus says, before you're trying to correct somebody, like deal with your own stuff. You have to resolve your own sin. Sometimes we always see somebody else's sin and it's hard to see our sin in that. Now, if you were abused verbally, sexually, or physically, I'm not saying in any way that it was your fault, but I'm talking about offense today. I'm talking about right now, people who maybe had certain things in their life that they were saying, I got hurt. It's important that we first take a moment and we through the power of the Holy Spirit reflect on our own heart. What was our part in this offense? I had a situation one time when I was really mad at this person who stayed in our house and I was so mad I was about to kick this person out. It wasn't my wife. It was one of the people that we let stay in our house. And this person just wouldn't come out of the room, wouldn't talk to me. And I was so mad. I was so mad. And I went to prayer, just, you know, vomiting to God how mad I was. And the Lord confronted me about my attitude. And I remember I was looking like, God, how dare you? Talk to me about my attitude. Like, I gave this person a place to stay. We paid off her car. We helped with this. We helped with that. They are so ungrateful. They are so easily entitled. Da, 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 da. And I just went at it. And the Lord just pointed to 1% of my fault in this big piece of pie of hurt. And so, and the Lord challenged me to go and repent first. And I remember, I was like, I am not going to repent for 1% of my fault when this person is 99% guilty. And the moment I repented for that 1%, this person broke down. Turns out they lost their mother. They lost somebody else. They just go, went through a very difficult time. And, and then I was so glad that I didn't attack them because I didn't even know what was going on with them. And so, and I learned that it's very important that when I am hurt and offended, I'm mad, want to burn everything to the ground, to take a moment and examine and look at my own heart and see, is there a log in my own eye? It needs to be pulled out and take ownership of that sin that I am contributing to this situation. And sometimes that could lead to more reconciliation and repentance. Third thing that you must do is you have to confront the offender. In Matthew 18, 15, it talks about when your brother sins against you, not to put it under the carpet, not to pretend it didn't hurt, not to pretend, ah, oh, it was not a big deal. The Bible says to go and talk to him. I've noticed so many people talk to everybody about what somebody did to them, except the person who did it to them. And they have this idea, well, they won't listen. 
Like they should have known they need to be the ones to apologize. But did you know that a lot of people that hurt you don't even know they hurt you? And sometimes you will be surprised that if you come up and you share what happened to you, how you experienced this person through what they did, you'd be surprised how many people will come to repentance and they will mature and grow in their sanctification because you were brave enough to confront lovingly. Number four, if you confronted that person, you dealt with your problem, you went to God, you need to go to a faithful friend and tell them if the situation isn't changing, you need to find a mentor, a pastor, or a friend who can help you. It's important not to fall for gossip. It's important not to try to destroy this person's reputation or a life or try to go online. The Bible says that if you talk to your brother, he doesn't listen. You grab another brother that you trust and then you can go in and try to find a resolution or a solution for the situation. Number five, pursue the very holiness others failed to exemplify. A lot of times when people see others commit sin or they act in a way that doesn't glorify Jesus, they kind of take all the breaks off and they feel like it is their job now without any boundaries, any filters, and any sort of checks and balances for their attitude and words to make everything right, to be the judge, the jury, and the executioner. And they become heresy hunters and they go on this vengeance, you know, mission. We're going to make everything right. We're going to bring justice. We're going to bring the hammer. We're going to bring righteousness. And sometimes they do it in such a way that actually they lose the very thing that they're accusing other people of not having they begin to lose. Number six, trust that love will prevail. Love does cover sins. Love will abide. So many times we feel like, man, if I'm going to do the right thing, confront the offender. I'm going to resolve issues in my own heart. I'm going to get others involved to help me deal with this issue. I'm going to pursue righteousness. You know, love, I'm not going to love people anymore. I'm not going to love my enemies. I'm not going to love people anymore because, you know, what is that going to do? But the Bible says that love is very powerful. Christian love doesn't make light of sin, doesn't minimize it, doesn't take the blame for sin when there is none. But Christian love, not only it covers people's sin, meaning when you confront a person lovingly, when you pray for them, something can happen. This godly Christian biblical love can bring transformation. And lastly, forgive and remember. Forgive that person that hurt you and remember how God has forgiven you. Now, forgiving somebody doesn't mean you immediately restore the trust. Forgiving opens an opportunity for trust. In many cases, there are cases where there is no more opportunity for regaining of the trust at all on this side of eternity because of what that person did. And it is wise to never trust that person as long as you live. It doesn't mean you shouldn't love them and it doesn't mean you shouldn't forgive them. But if a person abused your child sexually, they shouldn't even be close to children. Why? Because that trust has to be broken. Even if they have repented, they're still, they, they, they're marked in that area completely. They shouldn't be trusted with children because that's the area of their weakness even down the road. Now, you can disagree with me, but I believe it's practical Christian wisdom. We do have to forgive and remember how God has forgiven us and remember that forgiveness doesn't mean restoration of trust. Trust is built over time. It's broken quickly and it has to be rebuilt even slowly. Don't let somebody whom you forgive bully you into this lie. Oh, you've forgiven me. That means everything is back to normal, how it used to be. No, it's not like that. It's kind of like when you hurt somebody just because they got gone, they got the bullet pulled out of them. It doesn't mean they can run again. It means they need to heal now. And then they, some can walk and some people will never be able to walk the same way as they walked before. They will limp for the rest of their life, even though they've forgiven but they won't be the same. There will be scars that they will carry. Even Jesus, after he forgiven his offenders, people who hurt him, you know, he died, he came back, he has scars to remind us, of course, of his love for us. But at the same time, I think it also tells us that when you forgive, your wounds can turn into scars and your scars can become a testimony. And so, and become a reminder, this is what I've been through. This is what God healed me from. So I just want to encourage you today that if you're going through a church hurt or maybe you fell into that, there's light at the end of the tunnel and that light is not the train that's going to hit you. That light is Jesus' love for you. And run to the cross. Go to God in prayer. Deal with your own sin. Confront the offender. Find a faithful friend. Don't gossip. Pursue holiness. Remember that love will prevail 
forgive as you have been forgiven. Thank you for watching this video. I would love to hear your experience with church hurt. Have you ever been hurt? What helped you to overcome church hurt? Let me know in the comments below. As always, don't forget to hit like, subscribe, and share this video with your family, friends, your small group, and groups that you belong to on Telegram, WhatsApp, or Viber, or any other platforms. It will mean so much. Thank you.